Well, hello and welcome, and thank you for dialing in to our investment update this morning. I'm really excited about what we're going to cover today. We're going to be looking at investment markets and then the psychology of investing, which I think is a really, really interesting topic. Um, this is pre-recorded, so we won't be able to take live questions today, but hopefully it will trigger some questions for you. And if you do want to follow up, please do um, speak to your private banker or financial planner, and I'm sure they'll be only too happy to help. So first up, introductions. I'm Ben Covey. I head up the private bank here at Santander UK. I'm joined in the room by Paul Davies, a behavioral psychologist um, with 20 years of experience of helping organizations understand the psychology of investing. Hi, Paul. Thanks for joining us. Good morning. And we're joined on the screen by Simon Derling, a senior investment specialist at Santander Asset Management, um, also our investment writer. And many of you will be familiar with Simon's weekly um, state of play, which I would highly recommend if you haven't seen it. So, Simon, thank you for joining us. Good morning, Ben. So let's let's dive straight in. So um, I say we're going to talk about investments, and then we're going to talk about the psychology of investing. But let's let's start with investment markets. Um, it's been an extraordinary year in 2022. Um, I would call it an emotional roller coaster. I think I'd go as far as to say that, Simon. But perhaps you can summarise for us the key factors. Um, behind the year that was 2022. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Yeah, I think 2022 will uh, go down in history as one of the most eventful years that uh, I think we've probably experienced for obviously lots of different reasons. Um, what I'd like to do, first of all, is just kind of almost break down a little bit of the background uh, and try and explain what happened and a little bit about why uh, things happened the way they did. Um, I think in some respects, the first thing we probably need to reflect on is that why last year was so different from what had gone before is that the you know since 2008 since the financial crisis um, in some respects savers in particular have endured a really really tough 15 years uh, of very very low interest rates and very low savings rates uh, now the benefit uh, to those investing during that period of time was almost a golden period with very low interest rates and you know, certainly those with investments whether that be bonds or shares have benefited from you know if they've invested for long enough, a very, very good investment return relative to history. Now, ultimately, 2022 changed all that. And, and in some respects, that kind of began before the start of 2022, um, when, you know, the world's economies were coming out of the pandemic. Um, the pandemic had um, lots of, obviously, you know, obvious consequences, both, you know, in terms of health and well-being. But in some respects, financially, you know, it's the first time we've witnessed the, the world's economy, you know, come to a pause. Uh, and when, you know, the economy started to reopen, one of the big consequences was that there was a huge amount of pent up demand, um, which started to increase our price rises. Uh, and so, you know, during the, the last kind of 30 years, we've had very, very low inflation relative to history. Uh, and that all changed. And so these price rises started to come in initially when there's too many people wanting too many goods and not enough being made. Uh, and the fact that those goods uh, you know, were quite problematic to move them around the world. We've been kind of used to um, you know, stuff being manufactured in kind of the Far East and China and India, and then being put on ships and containers and then distributed to the West. Uh, and ultimately that became problematic and expensive. Now, importantly, once prices started to rise, um, you know, the first thing that uh, we need to kind of recognise is that initially the central bank's reaction to that was perhaps considered in hindsight slow. Um, now, you know, they, their kind of language during that period is to say that inflation was temporary and it was because of the, you know, the, the consequences of the pandemic, but it would literally wouldn't last that long. And unfortunately, that proved not to be the case. Uh, and so central banks eventually started to, to start to rise interest rates at the end of 2021, but the start of last year. Now, importantly, uh, as we all know, uh, unfortunately, the conflict in Ukraine then began 24th of February. Uh, and that ultimately were exacerbated the price rises that we saw. And in particular, uh, obviously, with energy and food prices. Um, both Ukraine and Russia uh, are a significant producer of grain and other raw materials, uh, food, food materials. Uh, and also, you know, they produce uh, quite a bit of the world's oil. And in particular, Russia is relied upon by Europe in particular for gas. Now, obviously, when those price rises started to kick in, uh, once the conflict really uh, started in earnest, then 
central banks became very different in their reaction to how they wanted to handle inflation. And in particular in the US, the US Federal Reserve decided to become very aggressive in increasing interest rates. Now, one of the, the, the key consequences of doing so is that obviously two things happened. One, those interest rates started to affect how investments were valued. But the other important factor was that you know, the US increasing rates very aggressively relative to other central banks meant that the dollar appreciated in value. Uh, and when you consider energy and raw materials and you know, most of the world's goods that are traded, they tend to be traded in dollars, which you know, certainly for the UK uh, savers, investors and, and people living here, it meant that we imported quite a lot of inflation from that change in currency. Um, so kind of the, the key consequences once interest rates started to rise was that if you were investing in bonds or shares, those valuations changed gradually over the year. Uh, and importantly, the biggest single impact, I think, for investors is the fact that both bonds and share values fell at the same time. Ordinarily, if you're going to design an investment uh, aligned to somebody's comfort and their risk level, you would want to mix both bonds and shares in the right proportion so that they, you know, they enjoyed the right type of investment journey. And for those looking for higher risk, clearly they would have a higher proportion of shares. But when you have bonds and shares falling at the same value, uh, sorry, at the same time, uh, and certainly with bonds by significant amounts of value, you end up with pretty much the regardless of your risk profile, uh, you've had a really, really tough 2022. And I think it's important to highlight those in low risk investments or lower risk investments uh, endured a really, really tough period. Um, you know, certainly for bonds, it's the worst performing uh, year for bonds, but over 50 years, you have to go back to the 70s, the last time we saw that kind of environment. And last year was worse than that. So, you know, it's it's been a, a really rough ride. And uh, I would imagine those children uh, have probably felt the pain. Uh, and it's, you know, it's been difficult to watch, uh, and difficult to experience. Thank you, Simon. No, really good synopsis. And, and I'm going to just add, I think, you know, for me, that bond revaluation, which was probably, you know, a once in a generation event, that has now happened. That revaluation has happened. So actually the outlook from here, one could argue, is a lot more favourable. And, and I'm not going to draw you on that. So I'm going to come to you a little bit later on, on the outlook. So we, we've covered the year that was, and I'll come back to you if that's all right, Simon, no shortly to, to look at the year ahead, um, where we will touch on that. But, but let me turn to Paul here in the room. So um, Paul, I said at the beginning, you know, an emotional roller coaster, which certainly we've heard from Simon there, what happened in markets and for investors and for many of our clients, you know, they experienced that roller coaster firsthand. Um, what are the emotional drivers that, um, that come to the fore and how can, how can they help or hinder investors? Well, I suppose investors, like everyone, all of us really, react to events and things going on around us, and we adapt our behaviour with that. And um, you, as Simon's just outlined, the last year or the last few years really has not been really very short on giving us events to react to. So probably the biggest emotional driver is people's anxiety about losing money. Now, that sounds obvious. You don't need a psychologist to tell you that we worry about losing money. But really, when you start to pick apart how the sort of chance of loss affects all of our behaviours, then it comes actually really very interesting. And the thing is that psychologists have looked at this in quite a lot of detail. And what they found is the feeling of losing money feels about twice as worse as winning the equivalent amount of money or gaining the equivalent amount of money. So in other words, if um, you were to win a competition and you won hundred pounds, you would feel a certain amount of pleasure getting that hundred pounds. Now, if you lost hundred pounds, say you lost your wallet or something like that, then you would obviously feel a certain amount of displeasure or pain. And that's the thing which psychologists have picked on, that it's not the same. What's the objective amount of £100, either gaining or losing, is the same? The subjective feeling of gaining £100 is less than the subjective feeling of losing £100 by about twice as much, uh, really. So what happens is people tend to avoid entering into any situation that has the chance of risk and the chance of loss, unless there's a 
significant difference so they could get much, much more the other side. So what I can do is just see how that works uh, in reality. I, I, can, okay. I can do something with you that I've got a coin um, and I can flip the coin. Now, if the coin lands heads up, you will give me 10 pounds. The thing is, you get to decide how much, if it lands tails up, you want to win. So that's the choice you get. You can decide that you know that if you lose, you've got to give me £10. How much would you need to win in order to say, Paul, I'm willing to take that bet with you? To take that bet with you, Paul. Gosh, um, I'd like £20, please. Yes. <laughs> okay. Why didn't you choose £10? Because that feels like a zero-sum gain. I want to gain more than I might lose. Exactly. It's that nobody ever is going to choose £10 because we know inside that that feeling of losing is actually more than the winning. So you would never go £10 gain for a £10 loss, a 50-50 chance, as it were. You'd always go more. You went pretty much bang on twice as much. We've done this experiment a lot, and it's a very famous experiment in psychology. People often don't even choose £20. They go 50, 100, 200, 300. It's got to be significantly more in that sense in order to go, yeah, I'll take that. And it's not just a psychological Thing either it's actually physical pain now the brain is hardwired for us to stay away or to keep us away from situations where we could lose because it knows how much that hurts us and when you put people into brain scanners for instance and you give them tasks to do such as the coin toss uh, experiment i just uh, played with you or actually they do give them investment decisions to make as well what they find is the areas of the brain that light up are the anterior insula and the thalamus. Okay. Now, I'm not expecting you to know what those are, but actually the anterior insula is to do with the regulation of physical pain. And the thalamus is uh, associated with emotions such as disappointment, regret, sadness, and of course, loss. So we just kind of always want to sort of stay away from it. And the ramifications of understanding that natural anxiety to loss has greater ramifications Yes, obviously investing and saving, we can see that. But why is it when people go to a new city that they generally err towards going towards the familiar chain restaurants rather than taking a chance on the odd restaurant they've not been to before? I mean, these days, it only takes a quick TripAdvisor, Google look to see if that restaurant's good or not. But more people go towards what is familiar because really that chance of gaining something superior doesn't outweigh the chance of actually just going, I'm okay with just something that's okay, thank you very much. And that then relates directly back to where we see people not investing money in market downturns, putting money into savings, cash ices, and even just leaving it in their current accounts. Because actually the certainty of what is a, what they would term an okay return is better as a feeling than taking the chance on a superior return. Yeah, that's really clear. I think you summed it up at the end there really well, Paul. So it's that certainty and perhaps perceived safety um, relative to investing that makes, makes clients hold the cash and not make that step into investments. Um, okay, it's interesting. So one of the, one of the areas Santander have been developing recently is our risk profiling methodology. And we're looking to bring in risk is alongside the risk attitude, loss aversion. So we just talked there about loss aversion. So we're now bringing that into our risk profiling. And the other one is present bias. The, you know, the desire to want returns today rather than waiting for you know, a longer holding period to perhaps potentially get a better return. Yeah. Um, but let's, okay, let's keep talking about the emotions, Scarlett. I, I think this is a really interesting um, area to explore. Um, composure and the um, the way we react when markets are perhaps volatile. What's your advice to, to an investor? How can they remain composed and perhaps not panic when all around them the headlines might be quite bleak? Yeah, it's it really interesting. I think composure is an odd one. We think it's sort of a skill we can have. Actually, the best thing to do is acknowledge that the emotion you will feel at a time of the heat of the moment, when you just suddenly look at your investments and they have dropped, or you hear in the news markets have, uh, have decreased, you're going to react emotionally. 
And that's always the first step, just to uh, be humble enough to say, I will. And if anyone out there is uh, sort of listening to this and thinking, well, I understand how people may react in this way, but I wouldn't, um, then actually they've probably handicapped themselves already. They've, they've gone down the path of thinking that they're different. And you're fighting millions of years of evolution here. So it's a very difficult thing to try and fight. And it's not only psychologists that say this. Uh, Warren Buffett, probably the most famous and often cited investor, um, says that you know, success when investing doesn't correlate with intelligence. Once you sort of gain a certain level of like IQ, actually what you need to do is control the urges that make other investors take rash decisions. And that's what the sort of thing is, to be humble enough to accept that in that heat of the moment, you need to be, your, your brain structure almost physically changes, at least the neurochemicals in your brain make it changes. And we know this, if ever you've had road rage or anything like that, at the heat of the moment, you'll shout, you'll react, you'll do something, and then you'll calm back down and go, oh, okay, I think I overreacted slightly there. That's how we're naturally uh, uh, seen to react in that way. And that kind of leads then on to two direct tips, which people can look at their composure, I suppose. And, and the first one is always do the analysis, always have a look at uh, you know, what you're going to do when you're in a cold, rational state of mind and when the markets are not really doing very much. And then make sure that you're going to follow that analysis and the actions you set yourself. What you can do is set yourself what we call in psychology, if then statements. Okay. And if then statements, and you can literally write these down, is to go, if I see the market, will my performance fall by 5%, then I will hold my position and not sell. Because setting it ahead of time is acknowledging that actually when it does happen, you're, you're going to get flustered. You're going to get sort of uh, make a decision which could be very short termist and actually hobble you in the long run. And professions such as the military and obviously medical professions as well, they train their teams with if then statements because they know in the heat of a battle or when a medical emergency suddenly comes in, they shouldn't be making decisions on the fly. They should be following a set of algorithms which you can just get into that groove. So these if then statements are like the sort of <clears throat> personal algorithms really we can follow. And then that leads me on to sort of the, sort of the next tip, which is, Again, once you acknowledge that, yes, when it's in the heat of the moment, I will probably make a decision that I will regret later, then actually you can start to say, why don't you hire an unemotional third party to help with that? And people like financial advisors and private bankers are perfect because they are not you. They are one step removed from that emotion. So they are neurologic, neurologically better armed to make decisions about your money than you are. That's why one of the things is always try and think, can I speak with somebody who's an, both an expert in the area, but they are one step removed emotionally. And that's a good way to invest. Yes, the removes that, they're not, they don't have that passionate reaction to the news flow. They can be hopefully level-headed, I think is what we're looking for here. I really like that if then, so you know, anticipating future market volatility, which inevitably we will see. So if and we see that, then this is what I will do. And it actually takes me back to the conversations the advisors in the business here were having with clients in the volatility in 2022. So you know, we saw a number of events that triggered volatility. We were speaking to clients saying, well, we're seeing this volatility, remind ourselves why we invested for the long term. So let's cut through the very, very short term pain that we're suffering. We're feeling that loss. So we're feeling that loss that we don't want to be feeling. But let's remind ourselves why we've invested for that five, 10 year time horizon. Is that still a valid objective? Do we still want to achieve that over the longer term? Yes, we still need to, you know, we still have that. In which case, staying the course, staying invested, tends to be the right thing to do. And certainly for those clients where we had that conversation in 2022, it came, came to pass yeah. that that had to be the right And you can to. even do it so that you know, the motivation to invest decreases when the market goes down as well. So even people who are invested may not pull out, but they're not going to invest anymore. But in that cold, rational state, they all know that the good strategic thing is to buy when the market's low. 
And yet when that feels the market's low, the last thing you want to do is put more money into something which is going down. So an if then statement, if I see markets drop, I will talk about adding more to my investment. At least it sets that algorithm in the cold rational point for you to deal with later. Yeah, that, no, that's brilliant. And you're absolutely right. It feels uncomfortable potentially going against the herd, going against the market movement. But over the very long term, that could have actually transpired to be a brilliant decision. So if you'd had the conversation about that at the outset and said, okay, if we, the if and then, if we see this happen in 2023, then this is the course of action we'll take. Um, I think you'd be set up for a much, well, hopefully a more successful investment outcome in the fullness of time. Um, that's brilliant. Thank you, Paul. Let me, let me bring back in Simon then. We're starting to talk about 2023. Um, so coming back to markets, Simon, what, what do you think the op opportunities are for investors in 2023? Well, I think the first thing to, to say, Ben, is to acknowledge, obviously, that one of the consequences of uh, such a tough 2022 is that, you know, with uh, investments like bonds and shares being repriced, is that whilst those invested have suffered from the pain of them falling in value, for those either considering adding to their investment, as Paul has just mentioned, um, you know, or those who are actually for the first time sitting down and thinking, well, you know, I'm not sure what to do. There's lots going on and, and I'm slightly concerned. And I'm worried about all of the, you know, the uncertainty. I think it's, first of all, really important to recognise that obviously when investments fall, um, you get more for your money. Um, if you're going to invest today relative to a year ago, uh, you know, to take as a very prime example, uh, UK gilts uh, are one of the kind of the bond areas that most UK investors invest in. So it's considered the kind of the risk-free rate. Um, you know, uh, in the past, UK bonds have done very, very well, UK yields. As their interest rate that they were offering continued to fall, the value of the, the, the gilts actually went up. That was completely reversed last year. Gilts actually fell 25% in value over the whole year. Uh, now, that's a significant discount today for somebody looking to invest. The other thing is, is that because gilts are paying the coupon and interest rate, that coupon a year ago uh, was less than 1%. Uh, whereas today it's closer to 4%. So I think for, for, from an opportunity perspective, anybody looking to review their finances and put a plan in place, one of the, you know, the consequences of last year is today is an you know, exceptionally good time to consider putting that plan, provided it's long term, you know, putting, it, you know, putting uh, something together today. Uh, I think um, in terms of the outlook uh, for what to, to look for, I think, you know, really and truthfully, inflation was the dominating uh, feature of last year. And in some respects, there's going to be a shift from inflation. And whilst it still remains dominant, I think now what we have is both, you know, uh, inflation is being watched very closely. So are central banks. And importantly, so are the, the economies around the world. Because at the moment, we're at a, at a tipping point. Central banks have you know, signposted that they intend to continue to increase their interest rates, certainly in the first few months of this year. And I think ultimately the intention there is to ensure that inflation doesn't remain sustained. Um, sustained inflation is not good for anybody, not good uh, really for economies. It's certainly not good for, good for individuals. Uh, and if you go back to the 1970s, it's a prime example of where inflation can actually be very detrimental to, to everybody. Mm -hmm. So I think central banks, their intention, their signpost is to increase rates. Now that may change. Now there are two key things that may change that. First of all, is that they'll be keeping a watchful eye on inflation. If inflation does start to fall quicker than they forecast or anticipated, then there is the possibility that central banks may press the pause button on rates, rate rises. And in fact, if, if it falls much quicker than, than they predicted, there is the possibility to the latter end of the year that they may even consider cutting rates. Now, one of the reasons is that, um, you know, it depends really much on the economic news that we then start to filter in in the first few months of this year. There's already, I would imagine, the markets at the moment have kind of priced in quite a, uh, a gloomy outlook. And the expectation at the moment is that the UK is either already in recession or is likely to go into recession. And that really applies to the Eurozone as well. Now, the US is in slightly better uh, position economically. Uh, but again, uh, the US Federal Reserve are worried about inflation through the economy, and, and in particular, they're worried about jobs. Uh, at the moment, the uh, employment market in the US is very tight, uh, and that simply means that there are 
uh, quite a lot of jobs and not actually as many people looking for jobs. So, you know, the unemployment rate uh, in the latest data fell to, you know, almost the lowest it's ever been at three and a half percent. And the anticipation is obviously that means that uh, anybody uh, looking to recruit somebody is often having to pay them a much better incentive wage for them to come and join them over somebody else. And it means with wage rises, the central bank in the US is worried about wage rises then uh, keeping in price rises uh, at a higher rate than they want them to be. So I think if the econ economic news worsens, ordinarily that would mean that stock markets would react badly to it. Uh, bizarrely, in the current circumstances, bad news may actually mean good news for investments. And it's simply because if economic news is worse and the economy is slowing, then central banks would recognise that price rises may fall quicker than anticipated. And they have to, you know, they don't need to use interest rates as much to slow the, the economic demand. So I think if, if, as I say, we see poor economic news and inflation falls much quicker, then the outlook for interest rates may change dramatically. And if they do, then that will change the way in which both bonds and shares are priced. And, you know, you'll probably see that um, bond yields may fall slightly. And then that means the values go up. And in particular, with shares, what will happen is that markets will reprice what the future looks like. Because stock markets only ever look forward. They're only worried about what they think the, you know, the economy or you know, effectively a, a particular company, how they'll perform in the future based on the information they have today. You know, the, the expression that's been used about stock markets, they're a barometer, not a thermometer. You know, they're kind of checking the pressure about what the weather will be tomorrow or next week. It's not about what, you know, whether it's raining today. So I think, you know, in summary, you know, the outlook is uncertain. It remains uncertain. I think ultimately for somebody investing today, uh, obviously there's a significant discount in terms of investing on the price of what those assets are. And clearly, um, you know, it, whether inflation or economic news changes uh, from what we expect it to be, then that will see a reaction from central banks. And that may change the way in which um, market participants, investors, uh, fund managers, that may change the way they feel about the price of assets today. And I'm going to, I'm going to be bold here, Simon. I'm going to go completely off script and endeavour to summarise that in two sentences. So in 2023, we actually see, and you have the, you, you have the licence to correct me if I get this wrong, um, a, a tough year for the economy as it works through a recessionary period but a better year for markets as it anticipates a recovery. Is that fair? Yeah, I, I think, uh, yeah, you uh, you pinpoint a really, really important factor, and that is that it depending on, you know, so if you look at bonds uh, or shares, they react slightly differently uh, during the different cycles we go through. So the economic cycles are, are you know, kind of almost tried and tested. The only thing that uh, investors or experts don't know is how long those cycles will last. You know, we, uh, in some respects, um, you know, if you go back only a few years ago, we were going through one of the longest economic cycles, investment cycles we've seen ever. And, you know, then we went into the pandemic and went through probably one of the shortest cycles we've ever seen in terms of a downturn from the, the global economy shutting and then the rebound when it reopened. Uh, and at the moment, I think at the end of the day, you know, the anticipation is bonds in some respects are probably close to fair value today, if you speak to any of the experts, simply because, and whilst the central banks may increase interest rates in the next uh, two to three months, you know, much of, as you mentioned before, much of that interest rate rise has already happened. For shares, it's slightly different is that, you know, you will tend to find that shares will probably remain volatile for the next, you know, one, two, three, four months. And as the economic cycle changes and we get into the acknowledgement that recessions here, then what happens is, as, as we talk about stock markets looking forward, they tend to price in what the future will be. And then you see that reaction. And it's just a question of when that may happen. Nobody knows when it's gonna, you know, they couldn't pinpoint the day to say, oh, by you know, 12th of February, well, all of a sudden market's gonna change and that's the point to buy. Nobody knows when that will be, um, but we're pretty close to at that point where it may turn. No, that's brilliant. Thanks, Simon. And we're in danger of moving into what is probably a whole nother session talking about timing the markets and perhaps why you shouldn't try to time the markets. But we'll save that for another day. Um, I can see that my countdown timer has um, counted down, so I need to bring it to a close. So um, let me thank um, both speakers. So Simon, um, really insightful. And Paul, thank you for um, helping us understand the emotional roller coaster that we've all been on and, and, and how that affects us as investors.
And to those of you that have, have stayed with us to the end, thank you for, for um, listening in. Um, if you want further information, there's a number of areas you can go to get more information. Um, the santander.co.uk website is a great place to start. And if you follow the private banking tab, you'll find a news and insights section in there where we do host quite a lot of content, including um, Simon's weekly state of play. Um, also look out for us on social media and we do look to share content on there as well. Um, but that's all from us today. Do, do tune in um, again as we will be looking to um, produce these at least monthly. Um, and so there'll be plenty more topics covered in the months ahead. Thank you very much.